the performer. Without further ado.
I just forgot to, uh, that was nice that Sarah uh, mentioned the date of the composition and uh, uh, the composer's age. On the first piece, I forgot to say that it was really amazing that he wrote uh, Danza Caracteristica when he was 17 years old. And now we're going to listen to uh, a lullaby he actually arranged. It's kind of like composition like composition arrangement of the Cuban popular song Drume Negrita played by Hunter alumni Nora Spielman.
Baba Nora, congratulations. And by the way, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> Little birdie told us, happy birthday, Nora. What a wonderful way to celebrate your birthday with a fine performance of Leo Brower's music. Brava. So, and the next set up are six of the uh, Estudios Sencillos. Six of the 10 will be played by four Hunter College students, two of whom are studying with Joao and two are studying with me. Wilfredo Ortiz, Dylan Harnett Marshall. Bibi Balasan and Gustavo Silviera. Hi, Nora. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, so without further ado, the uh, 10 etudes, they are written, they were written each to work on a particular technique, but they are so brilliant that they're so musical and passionate. They are actually worthy of the concert stage, especially as a set. And uh, it's, it's, uh, they're really, really fun to play. So without further ado,
It is my turn to announce the next piece. So also from uh, when Brower was, I think, 17 or 18 years old, it's from his first, uh, his early period. Uh, Los Tres Apuntes, which means the three sketches played by Crystal Rojas. I think the first one, we don't have like the titles for the three movements, but the first one is called Allegro. The second one is uh, Andantino, and it's based on a fragment from chamber music, as he calls it. And the third movement is uh, based on a Bulgarian uh, chant. So Los Tres Apuntes, the three sketches by Leo Brower, performed by Cristo Rojas.
Bravo, bravo. Crystal, that was amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, the next performer is one of my students, Lance Paibenga. Lance finished his undergraduate and is now working as a master's student. Okay, congratulations, Lance. <laughs> Uh, he's going to play Danza del Tipleno, which is the first movement from uh, three pieces from Latin American set. It was written in uh, 1962, which would make have made Brouwer 22 years old at the time, which again is younger than our performer, <laughs> Lance. Now we have the last, uh, not the last performance, but the last soloist, and it's going to be Brendan Cowell. And Brendan studied with me this piece uh, by Brower, I think, three or four years ago. And then when we, when Sarah and I uh, talked about doing this Brower hour, uh, I asked Brendan if he could like bring back the piece, which he did in, Brendan, you can correct me later, but I think he did in like two or three days. He brought back the piece. So we're gonna hear Leo Brower's uh, variations on a theme by Django Reinhardt. And it's a piece from 1984 that was written uh, by the great Leo Brower and as an homage to uh, his friend, uh, Robert Vidal, who was the organizer of the biggest uh, guitar competition in France at the time. So Brendan Cowell, Variations on the Theme of Django Reinhardt by Leo Brown. Thank you. 
privilege this term of serving as chamber music coach at Hunter College, guiding a very talented group of students on Leo Brower's guitar quartet, Pasaje Cubano con Ruba. We began the term working toward a live performance, but shifted to recording instead when COVID quarantine took over our lives. Despite the serious adversity that this caused us in New York City, this is an incident where we rose above it. I am so proud of these young people who turned tragedy into a win. Crystal, Lance, Gabby, Mike, you are amazing. The detailed work you've done with this ma matchsticks mutes at the opening, which is how we achieve the gamelan sound, to working in isolation with a click track, and the mastering of the sound at the end, even including spatialization, thank you, Mike. We've done good work here, and I hope that you will have the opportunity to perform this live in the future when it's safe to do so. But for now, we get to enjoy the recording here. May it touch the hearts of all, including Leo Brower himself. Thank you. 
Bravo. Oh, what a great way to conclude our tribute to the music of Maestro Leo Brower. Thank you so much. Uh, when Sarah and I, we talked about showcasing our guitar students, it was actually a coincidence that everyone was already working on a Brower piece. And what is not a coincidence is the fact that all of us guitaristists, we have played a Brower piece at some point in our lives. And like the, like the repertoire that was written uh, for the guitar by the maestro is such a part of like, like the mandatory repertoire every guitarist has to learn. It's, it's fundamental. Um, I want to also thank uh, all the students for their amazing work, such diligent work, especially during this very difficult semester. They did like so great. Uh, and also thanks, of course, to Maestro Brower for keep inspiring us and in writing this amazing music and contributing so much to the guitar repertoire. Thank you. And now I think we're ready for the Q&A. Bye-bye. See you in a bit. Does anyone have any questions to uh, ask the performers or anyone thought of anything during the, the concert? Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Um, Luis, you, um, do you know Brower personally? I asked that because you played a premiere of his just last week. Um, I was just wondering if you know him personally. Yes. So can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yes, I do. So I actually, I used to be part of a guitar quartet that actually came to Hunter College to uh, teach a master class. Uh, was it this year or last year, Sarah? I don't remember. I'm not sure. Uh... Here, this year. It was right before the pandemic, actually. It was this March. Yeah, so I used to be part of Quaternaglia, and we actually recorded all his uh, guitar quartet music in the like early 2000s. And I played with him when he went to Brazil. I, he conducted his, one of his uh, guitar, guitar quartet uh, concertos. And I, I, I had the pleasure to work with him and also went to Cuba to perform and premiere his works. And he was here in New York oh, last year, I think. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I knew him from before. So, Bravo. Any other questions? Uh... I, can I ask another question of, this, of the quartet that just played? I, I didn't get to see what instruments they were playing. It just, it sounded, I knew the instruments didn't sound quite like guitar. So some of them sound like gamelan. I don't know. Can you tell us about the the sounds that emanated from the quartet? Crystal, are you with us? Our guitar one. Crystal, yes. would you like to start and tell about the uh, the muting technique? Yeah. Um, hi everyone. We used um, mash sticks um, and we put them approximately about two. Um, centimeters away from the from the bridge um, and then they go in between the strings and the wood the top of the guitar and basically it sounds like a paper instrument yeah yeah, yeah it's one of it was the fourth uh, uh, the last option that Brower gave for how to uh, play the first section which is considered a mute but uh, we liked the way the matchsticks sounded. It was very specific that you needed two matches and that tells you where to put them uh, and that that should be placed one between, you know, three set strings. And it's very, very precise. And we did a lot of work uh, to match the sound because even though we use the same matchsticks, uh, you know, different guitars, different instruments are very different. Um, and Lance, if you're still with us, maybe talk a bit about that you had a little trouble getting yours to match everyone else's uh, yeah. uh yeah we had yeah had some issues getting the match sticks to to match everyone else's sound basically i was getting the most bizarre um out of tune sounding um tone so i think in well, the end 
you all get a little tweaked. You get kind of that total, yeah. which is why it sounds a bit like a gamelan. Um, but for some reason, yours was not getting the same. May have been the matchsticks. I think in the end, I ended up doubling up. So I had two, two pairs. So I had four matchsticks total. I had two next to each other. And I think that's how we finally got my sound yeah. to match. Is Gabby with us? I saw her for a bit, but I don't know if, yeah. if you're with Gabby. Yeah. Uh, you, you actually had the best sound naturally, and you weren't even using matchsticks, right? You used little sticks? Yeah. You still with us? Yeah. <laughs> but you placed them just the same way as the instructions, right? Um, yeah. And if I recall, um, your it's your uh, guitar with the with the little sticks in it that showed up in our video, right? Yeah. She was the first one to achieve the proper matchstick mute sound, and then the the rest of the group then emulated that, and we worked to you know it was not just the different guitars and the different matches; uh, it was also the um, you know different places we were recording. So since we switched from a live performance to a recording midterm because of COVID quarantine, of course. Um, it, it caused all different parameters to go into our listening for, for the sound. And uh, it was very interesting to work through uh, all, all of the details. Did that, uh, did that answer your question, Foundy? Yes. yes, thank you. Yeah, great. It was a very interesting piece. And yeah. to our knowledge, we haven't found another recording anywhere, at least online, that does the matchstick mute and mm -hmm. gets that that sound. So, well, I'm quite proud of these young people. <laughs> All right, so let's take one more question and then we'll call it a night. Anyone else have a, have a question? I don't see anyone's mutes going off. No? Okay, well, let's, let's finish then. Everyone turn your mutes off. And we'll give a round of applause for the maestro. Since the purpose of this event.